with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, June 13th, 2023. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America. Downtown Brooklyn, USA. Also uh, on the program today, Peter Shamshiri, or Law Boy on Twitter, co-host of the 5-4 podcast on the recent Supreme Court rulings as of Friday and the ones that we anticipate in the next couple of days. Meanwhile... Donald Trump to be arraigned at 3 p.m. today in Miami. It's Miami prepares for protests, which will unlikely develop into anything. And also, he apparently is still trying to find a lawyer. So, one of the questions we will be asking Peter Shamshiri, does he need another Does he need another gig? New poll, 81% of Republicans thinks Trump's charges are completely political and unfounded. Good news, inflation cools to its slowest pace in two years. Pace of inflation actually dropped almost a point in the past month. McCarthy allows his caucus to eat his spleen, and in return... They are allowing votes to promote semi-automatic gun accessories and thwart gas stove regulations. America. With COVID era extensions ending, over 1 million people have lost their Medicaid coverage as of yesterday. Also America. Sanders, meanwhile, Senator Sanders, meanwhile, to block all Biden health nominees until the administration produces a plan to lower drug prices. Trial bought, uh, brought by 16 young people in Montana versus it's, or I should say against Montana and its support of fossil fuels starts today. FTC sues to stop Microsoft and Activision deal. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. It is... Um, Newsday Tuesday. It is generally Newsday Tuesday. Today, though, we are actually like looking at some stories that I guess are in the news. Uh, last week, there was a surprise ruling, uh, or I should say the outcome was a surprise, on the Supreme Court in dealing with Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. We'll talk about that um, with Shamshiri, as well as the Tavesky case, or Talvesky case. I can't, I can never remember Tulevsky, how to pronounce it. I think. I can't pronounce it. It's not even going to try. Yeah. Uh, but was also a, an important case. And then we have two more cases, two very prominent cases that we're waiting on that could drop at any time. Student debt. Student debt and the affirmative action case. Um, and so we'll talk to uh, Shamshiri about all of those. But uh, first, the big story, of course, of the day, Donald Trump will be um, arraigned in a federal court. This is the first time he's done it in federal charges. This is the, uh, the, the thing that is impressive with Trump. He is going for the cycle. Yeah. He did the city um, arraignment mm -hmm. in New York. I guess it was like a month ago, right? Uh, he's doing the federal arraignment in Miami today. And then in like a month and a half in Georgia, could be two months, he's going to go for the state 
I believe that's a state charge. Mm. Yeah. And so he will have have hit the cycle. Let's see if we can get him to the Hague after that. I, and, I literally, that exactly. <laughs> Matt is just stepping on what I want to say, but I have a secondary point. It's kind of like, you know, when people go across the country and want to see different baseball stadiums <laughs> and just like have that on their bucket list. Trump's trying to go for like, I have been indicted in all 50 states and federal. And then maybe if we can go international. There's still, still time. Yeah. There's still time. <laughs> still time. Um, and uh, it is... The universality, it seems, of the assessment of these uh, charges against Trump is pretty stunning. Um, The only it it seems like the only people who don't think that these charges are legit in terms of this indictment. And of course, you're you're innocent until proven guilty. But I have never seen an indictment where the all legal i guess analysis from all sides Mm -hmm. has been so um almost unanimous in terms of their assessment yesterday we mentioned that uh donald trump had lost uh bill barr and had lost jonathan turley and i was like this is the only person left to lose is alan dershowitz and these are all people, maybe they're trying to reform themselves or whatever it is. But uh, here is Alan Dershowitz uh, also throwing in the towel and uh, realizing that oy, the uh, Trump train has uh, come to a slow roll. And uh, maybe it's back. It's time for him to be able to walk nude again uh, on Martha's Vineyard. Here it is. Rulings for him the last time. But first... <laughs> Alan Dershowitz cautioned me to have caution and to wait. We have waited. There's more in this indictment than they needed to put in there. What do you make of it? Well, this is a much stronger indictment than many people anticipated. It's clearly the strongest indictment that uh, Donald Trump ever faced. And the most important and the most difficult part of the indictment for Trump are two paragraphs, uh, paragraph 34 and paragraph 35. In paragraph 34, there is a tape recording, so you don't have to worry about lawyers' credibility or flip witnesses. His own voice is saying, see, as president, I could have declassified it holding up a paper. Uh, Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. That may not be a smoking gun, but it's a gun, and it's a very important piece of evidence, and it's enough to convict based on this terrible espionage law which is broad and uh, vague and never should have been enacted. Every liberal for the last hundred years has opposed it. Now they're applauding it because it's being used against Trump. But there's enough in that one statement to convict him of knowingly possessing unauthorized classified material. The fact that the classified material may have been about a plan to attack Iran is not technically relevant under the statute. But if the judge lets that in, it will obviously be deeply prejudicial yeah. to the jury. So Donald Trump has a lot to worry about. This indictment is much stronger, this part of it particularly, because it doesn't require witnesses. And there's no argument that lawyer-client privilege was violated. This is a clean right. issue. And if I were the prosecutor, I would have had a much, much narrower indictment focusing on that and less on the 37 repetitious counts of possessing this and possessing that. I think juries right, want to hear clear evidence, and there's good, strong evidence here. And he has to he has to rebut it. The- All right. Well, the beauty of this is that you notice, like Dershowitz never said that. You know, he said some people thought it wasn't going to be this wrong. He, he like it was just made himself sure that uh, he wasn't in any way, any way, critical of himself in the assessment. And of course, he comes up with, well, there's almost too many charges here. I would stick with the one that's a clear home run. Although, um, you know, I I think... No, you get more bites at the apple. Like, they're doing more counts because there's so many goddamn documents. And uh, Trump also, let's be clear, it it doesn't even appear he has a lawyer at this point. Uh, Like, he's going into court with uh, one guy who's already left his team, but apparently said, like, I'll come to court with you. Uh, but I'm not doing this. And then some other dude who's coming from out of state, just basically like, um, uh, you know, as a placeholder. So uh, Donald Trump seems to be in some type of trouble. However, 
there is someone who has a theory about the case and uh, who can reach out to Trump. And we'll see if this gets here's Kevin McCarthy was with his theory <laughs> on how uh, oh, Trump could get good. out of this. <laughs> But what about then there's those a pictures? Whole what nother... about those pictures? Was that a good look for the former president to have boxes in a bathroom? I don't know. Is it a good picture to have boxes in a garage that opens up all the time? A bathroom door locks. So, look, I don't want people to take these documents away, the vice president, um, Pence, but as a senator, you'd have to steal the documents. You know what concerns me is you have, you have these a lot of these documents behind a, a Corvette in, in a garage with the door wide open. And you've got, a, you've got a son of Hunter Biden who knows who he has there in and out. I mean, there's a lot of concerns on both sides. He meant Joe Biden. You know, the difference, Kevin McCarthy, is that the reason Pence and Biden are not getting prosecuted is because when it was found they had those documents, they, well, first Biden volunteered the information, they returned them immediately. They looked themselves, found it, and then gave it back. Exactly. Exa- I mean, it, 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 it is the flimsiest whataboutism, too. They can't defend it. Even what, like, Dershowitz was trying to say there about the Espionage Act. I, I This is the first time in my life, and I don't know, Sam, you can speak to this as well, have you heard the Republicans complaining about the broadness of the Espionage Act, you know, before when it was used to prosecute Chelsea Manning, when it was used to go after Edward Snowden? And journalists. And journalists. Um, I mean, they love that broadness because it, it's it's it, it has been in the past used to clamp down on dissent and reporting about government malfeasance. Um, the uh, I have to just point out um I, I, if I could give her a medal, I would. But the put uh, put this p- image up. That woman who asked the question with the blue uh, uh, lanyard, the uh, CBS reporter, is is she? Yeah, maybe she's she, her CBS. lanyard. CBS. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is she, Nicole Killian. Yeah. Is her name. The her ability to keep a straight face uh, <laughs> when she asked that question and he responds, "Would it be better if it was in a garage where it could bathroom just go like this? Bathroom door is lock. Um, the Corvette too. It's like yeah. More often than not, incidentally, cool bathroom doors lock from the inside. And uh, so, yeah. unless somebody was staying in there, <laughs> Good point. Like, well, hey, the documents. <laughs> Let's in. Look, when I take forty-five minute poops, those documents are safe for that forty-five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I'm keeping watchful guard on my throne, if you yes. know what that means. Yes, exactly. No one come in here. <laughs> I am sitting atop of the throne, looking at all of the fields and uh, the, the subjects, and they're all safe. They're all safe with me here. King of my kingdom. All right, well, we'll... Oh, no, about a toilet paper. Maybe they're not so safe. <laughs> <laughs> God. Um... Well, uh, we're going to take a uh, break in a moment. We'll talk to uh, Peter uh, Shamshiri, and I will offer him the opportunity to go uh, <laughs> represent Trump. I don't know if he does defense, but I, I think at this point... Uh, he's he's taken anybody. <laughs> Trump would take... Uh, any, which is not... I, I don't want to besmirch uh, Shamshiri. But no even, way. yeah, uh, law boy who definitely does not like Trump, he might take him too. <laughs> As soon as you said 45 minutes on the uh, toilet, uh, Matt, I was waiting for the IMs to uh, give me credit. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's so, that's why I didn't make it 20, because I yeah, exactly. wanted to cross yeah, that. Yeah, I appreciate that. A um, couple of sponsors today. This episode is brought to you by Zipix Nicotine Toothpicks. Um, Zipix brings you a satisfying, a convenient, and a great-tasting way to curb your nicotine cravings. It is time for you to stop smoking... Stop uh, vaping. Stop putting those vape oils and that smoke in your lungs. It is unhealthy. And and if you don't start, if you're not smoking or you're not vaping, do yourself one of the biggest favors you can do yourself. Do not start. Do not start. Um, it took me years and years to quit smoking. And one of the ways I did it uh, was... By substituting that oral, uh, uh, like a craving of, with toothpicks. And uh, for me, I don't touch the caffeine ones now. Zipix also has caffeine and B12 infused toothpicks. If you're not a nicotine user, or hopefully your end game uh, as you uh, get off cigarettes and vaping, um, and they're great. I maybe you notice during the show I am using a toothpick. Uh, sometimes uh, that's just the way it works. But uh, it is a great way for you to stop vaping, stop smoking, 
Um, they are uh, Zipix toothpicks give you an easier and a healthier and a more disc- discreet way to um, have your nicotine and to wean yourself off it. They are, it comes in six different flavors, uh, and they have options in two milligram and three milligrams of nicotine. Um, they are perfect for flights and sporting events, restaurants, literally everywhere else that uh, smoking and vaping are banned. And uh, they are one of the most cost-effective nicotine products on the market. Zipix has already helped tens of thousands of customers in leading a healthier life. And, and if, you are, if you currently smoke or vape, they can probably help you too. Make your lungs happy. Make your uh, people who have to smell you happy, yeah. frankly. Your doctor happy. Your doctor happy. And ultimately, believe me, if you get to my age, yourself much happier. Try Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Ditch the cigarettes. Ditch the vape. Get some nicotine-infused toothpicks at ZipixToothpicks.com today. Get 10% off your first order by using the code MAJORITY at checkout. Your lungs are going to be glad you did. And just a disclaimer, this product, at least the uh, the, the nicotine ones, can contain nicotine, which is an additive chemical, and you must be 21 or older to order. Zip more, smoke less with Zipix nicotine toothpicks. Uh, also today's program sponsored by ritual. Um, if there's something you want to do, uh, for your health, particularly as you get older, but I mean, I don't know how you're eating uh, and what kind of nutrition you're getting uh, at, at your age. Uh, ritual makes a multivitamin for men. That's based solely on science and designed to help fill common nutrient ga- gaps within the diet with 10 key nutrients. It is a scientifically developed multivitamin, has high quality key, uh, key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. In other words, your body can absorb these. Ritual is your new type of two a days from helping you support heart health with omega-3 DHA to normal muscle function and normal immune function with vitamin D3. This small step can have a major impact. My doctor, I've told, uh, said before many times, he said, uh, you're, 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 you're shy on uh, your vitamin D. Mm. Get that into your system. Uh, it has all sorts of health benefits, but it also helps in terms of like, uh, like uh, cancers down the road and uh, I think prostate cancer. And, um, uh, and here's the thing about a ritual that is different from um, almost all, I don't know, uh, other um, vitamins. It's made traceable, so you can see where your nutrients come from, and that is incredibly important because you want to make sure that what you're putting into your body is exactly what you think it is. It's vegan-friendly, it's non-GMO, it's sugar-free, it's gluten-free, it's major allergen-free. Their capsule has a delayed release designed to help it make it gentle on an empty stomach, which is also a huge benefit because, for me, there are two things that have kept me from uh, having uh, vitamins in the past. One is doing exactly that, having to always have it on a full stomach and then forgetting to do it after a meal. Like I need to see the bottle, take the vitamin when I see it, Mm. period, end of story. The other thing is that it is a subscription service. So when every time I've ever tried a multivitamin in the past, it was always, I'm doing it, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. I run out, I forget, I forget, I forget. And then I've totally forgotten. Uh, ritual, you get on subscription service, they send it to you, uh, and you do not, uh, forget it. Essential for men is a quality multivitamin. It's from a company you can actually trust and get this ritual is offering my listeners 10% off during your first three months. Visit ritual.com slash majority start ritual or add essential for men to your subscription today. Check it out. We will put the links in the podcast and YouTube description. Um, and we will see you, uh, we'll take a quick break and we'll see you, uh, it, we'll be back in a moment with, uh, Peter Shamshiri or law boy on Twitter, co-host of the five, four pack podcast.
We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Uh, joining us uh, again, uh, welcome back to the program, Peter uh, Shamshiri, or uh, known as Law Boy on uh, Twitter, to the extent that anybody's on Twitter anymore. Uh, and uh, the uh, five uh, co-host of the Five Four uh, podcast, and uh, if books could kill, it's my it's my latest uh, favorite to listen to. <laughs> so I just got to plug that for everybody. Plus five four as well. Um, know, it's more relevant to what we're talking about today. But so, uh, 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 Peter, I mentioned up front um, that I would ask you. Just uh, you're a lawyer. Um, mm -hmm. Donald Trump is looking for uh, have. Uh, we just got to get. We just got to like clear the decks of that uh any interest if if there's money up front i'll do anything uh, there you go all right well <laughs> we'll, we'll, send word. Uh, well appreciated um all right but in the meantime uh before you head off to miami um the uh let's talk about uh what took place on friday there were two decisions that came down um both i think at least one was a bit of a shocker for everybody yeah. Uh, it was a, um, uh, a voting rights act. Um, I don't know if there is a more prominent, um, opponent or whose history of, of being against the voting rights act is greater than John Roberts. I mean, this was yeah. almost like his inciting event as a, as a, um, uh, as a lawyer, uh, in, in associated with our government. But, but why don't you take it from there? Uh, first, I guess, uh, tell us what exactly the case was in Milligan. Yeah, the case was a challenge under the Voting Rights Act to the districts in Alabama. Uh, there were there are seven districts in Alabama, seven congressional districts. Twenty seven percent of the population is black. And there was a single black uh, majority district. When if you do the math, it should really be two. Uh, so. We should say challenge. out of seven. That's that's one yeah, out, out of seven. seven. Which I, I think two out of seven ends up being twenty eight percent. So there are twenty seven percent black voters. It makes sense that you'd expect two districts. Uh, so the challengers to the district bring a voter dilu a vote dilution case, and uh, that gets analyzed under a framework from the nineteen eighties. There's this case called uh, Jingles, which has this whole sort of uh, this really long process you work through to uh, see whether there's been vote dilution. And going into it, I think the expectation was that John Roberts was going to lead the charge to either weaken that test or uh, potentially find that Section 2, as it's currently interpreted, is unconstitutional because it requires in function the consideration of race. Uh, and so, you know, to... I think most people were shocked when not only did he not find Section 2 unconstitutional, but he stuck with the test and sort of dutif dutifully applied it and uh, said that Alabama needs to create a another majority black district. What what makes Section 2 distinct in that way from the other parts of the Voting Rights Act, right? Because it's not as much about intent as, you know, right. Roberts had argued in the past. It's about outcome. That's right. So the there were amendments to Section 2 in the early 80s that uh, basically there's a Supreme Court case that said this is actually about intent. You have to prove discriminatory intent, which is, of course, very hard to do. Uh, Congress amends the uh, law to say, no, you don't need to prove intent. You just need to show that it is discriminatory in practice. Uh, John Roberts was uh, a lawyer working against those amendments, uh, working to say that, uh, you know, on behalf of, I think, the Reagan administration to say yeah. that the uh, the amendments should not uh, pass. They did anyway. Uh, but that's why it's sort of unique, because it doesn't really matter in this case whether Alabama can prove that they were not trying to do anything racist. Uh, all that matters is the output. What's also interesting to me, too, is that it's not like, I mean, just it's it's one of the just because Congress had amended the Voting Rights Act to be explicit in this instance is no protection, or at least it hasn't been in the past for the Voting Rights Act. I mean, right. I right. mean, like we, we saw in Shelby, uh, which was the case in 2013, 
where they were looking at plea. Uh, I think it was uh, pre-clearance, right. where the court uh, between Scalia and at all basically said the only reason why uh, Congress reauthorized the uh, Voting Rights Act would I guess it would have been five years earlier, six <laughs> years earlier, was because they're afraid of right. like being considered to be racist, and so we don't need to pay attention to that. <laughs> That's right. And I think it was Scalia at oral argument said the fact that the reauthorization of preclearance had uh, been something like 98-0 in the Senate. He said that that actually works against it. It, it proves that it that it's sort of, uh, you know, not really truly being considered by Congress, uh, which I always found a bit rich considering I think he was appointed uh, under about the same number, 96-98-0. Right. Uh, the the uh, you know the Roberts approach to the Voting Rights Act has really not shown a lot of rhyme or reason other than generalized opposition to the Voting Rights Act, which I think is why this caught people off guard. I mean, Shelby County has almost no constitutional undergirding at all. He just didn't seem to like the preclearance regime. Uh, so the fact that he would come out here and just sort of fully embrace. Uh, what is undeniably a, a court created test from the eighties that this court would almost certainly never create it. I mean, it was jarring. Not everyone was shocked, but I was shocked. Yeah. Um, and, and we should say that the, uh, the way that they basically killed the pre clearance, uh, provision was they didn't actually say you can't have a pre clearance provision. In other words, that States that had a history of, of racial discrimination, uh, had to get permission to change their voting laws from the DOJ. It's that how you choose which those states are needs to be updated in a yep. way that Congress is just going to have to figure out and basically for all intents and purposes, you know, threw it into uh, oblivion. So they could have theoretically done the same thing with this case, right? Is say, right. we don't have a problem with, with, uh, with, you know, a provision that says, you got to change it if the outcome is uh, diluted, but you just need to calculate that in a different way. Right. They could have punted it to Congress in different ways. Um, they could have simply demanded race neutrality, which is what Alabama was pushing for. Alabama was basically saying we, you know, we have all these ways to go about creating districts that are race neutral. And the counter to that was, well, hold on, the whole point of the Voting Rights Act is to very specifically protect the voting rights of black people in particular and in the South in particular. Uh, so going in with a race neutral approach doesn't really make a ton of sense here. This is something that Katanji Brown Jackson uh, brought up in oral argument very effectively. Um, and, you know, Roberts has a history of embracing that sort of race neutrality as a constitutional principle. Um, so I think that was a big fear. There was a fear that they could knock it back to Congress with the full knowledge uh, that Congress wasn't actually going to do anything because they because uh, Congress is in deadlock on every uh, substantial issue. Uh, and, you know, uh, on the other hand, they could have they could have just outright struck down Section two, which you can essentially see that Clarence Thomas and his dissent would, would love to do uh, the. So I'm going to ask you to like uh, uh, go. Uh, there were two things that went on here. And one was that the. The, the first time that these um, uh, lines, the, these districts were challenged was back in 2020 in the run up to the 2022 election. And it made it to the Supreme Court in the shadow docket. They basically said, no, we're, we're not going to deal with this here. Um, right. Kavanaugh voted the other way. Mm -hmm. um, Roberts voted to... Um, uh, against punting it, but only because he didn't think it should be on the shadow docket. Right. What do you think happened between then, aside from the Alabama probably having one, uh, f you know, more Republican seat than they would have, uh, and maybe also Georgia? And I mean, it, well, yeah. let, let, let's put that aside because I want to ask you about that. But what do yeah. you think happened? Because also, uh, and you mentioned K uh, KBJ's... Um, discussion about the the intent of the reconstructionist amendments uh being specifically not race neutral um which is probably something that's never been articulated by any uh, uh you know because we're yeah. living in a different era of understanding of those amendments too what 
What do you think happened? I mean, I know this is complete speculation, but this is, yeah. this is your job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love to speculate. I think that I think that the most likely thing is that Roberts was feeling the heat institutionally, and he is an institutionalist, and he decided to moderate his vote on this issue, especially knowing that there were that Kavanaugh was going to come along. Um, if you look at the first, I mean, it doesn't make much sense. If you, you know, this this comes to the Supreme Court on the shadow docket. Roberts joins with the liberals, um, ostensibly on shadow docket grounds. Kavanaugh is apparently fully okay with the potentially unconstitutional map being used in a full election cycle, and um, and then switches the next year. The only the only thing I can think of that truly makes sense is that Roberts felt the heat and brought Kavanaugh along. Um, I also think that Kavanaugh is enigmatic in a in a way. Um, he had he really does have sort of odd beliefs about this stuff, and there are principles that were theoretically at play uh, in 2021 when it first came to the court that aren't at play anymore. Um, but I really I think that the prevailing theory that this was a, a case that would not have come out this way if you didn't have Dobbs, if you didn't have like the Clarence Thomas drama. Uh, I, I really think that Roberts goes the other way uh, and is just trying to let a little bit of heat out of the whole thing. That's that's my best guess. And, and you know that Kavanaugh likes beer. That's right. Okay. That's we all right. know that. Um, do you, let me ask you one more question about that and, 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 get, and then we'll move on. Um, how much do you think... Do you have any sense of where, not just the the way that Dobbs was decided and the heat that came from that, and not just like, you know, all the, the sort of, there's a tremendous amount of, I think, scrutiny on the court in terms of its ethics, which is, you know, uh, way overdue. And, and and there's, you know, rumblings of some type of reform in that manner, which, you know, for a guy like Roberts would make him look bad, I think. Um do you think that there's also anything going on with the uh, leak of Dobbs? Um, because the idea that the court couldn't find out who did it, Alito subsequently saying, like, I know who did it uh, <laughs> a, a, to after that, which I have no doubt, frankly, that he knows who did it, because I've right. been convinced from day one that it's someone he's associated with. He said we, that looking in a mirror. It, it, we know <laughs> we know that, you know, he did something to this effect back in what we in, in at least two other instances. Uh the Hobby Lobby, we know that he leaked uh, right. uh and we know in 2012 that he was uh, complaining about Roberts in the ACA case uh to the Washington Post. Um do you think that there is internally something going on with that because i'm also thinking about the um uh i the which the case now escapes me but where uh, kbj was the lone dissent and uh, uh coney robert uh, uh coney uh, barrett wrote the decision this was just um uh gosh the other day i can't even remember what oh, the yeah. case was yeah um the or, eight to one oh, glacier yeah, oh, yeah. glacier, yeah, uh, glacier northwest, glacier northwest like, yeah. do you think that this is playing like there's any dynamic here where the the idea of like Roberts, try, you know, corralling Kavanaugh and maybe, you know, sort of Martin Kagan working on Barrett like they're like how much of this is just yeah. sort of fever dreams in my head? Probably most of it. But, but I think that there is a uh, there's a degree to which in, in the general sense, you're you're probably right. It's hard to be it's hard to be right in the specifics. Uh, but I think that it seems as though Roberts is wrestling wrestling a bit for institutional control behind the scenes. Um, you know, part of this case, and I think maybe an underrated part of this case to non-lawyers especially, is that Alabama's lawyers were terrible and were really swinging for the fences and sort of bringing some extreme arguments as their primary arguments and sort of targeting the right wing of the court very directly. Uh, it's it's possible that someone like Robert sees that as a challenge to his own control over the court, mm. and it pushes him away from those arguments. Um, I, I think that this all sort of plays together in Robert's mind. If I had to guess, I don't know what the details are, and I you know we might never know, but 
it feels to me like it's unquestionable that Roberts wants to have control over the institution and feels in certain regards like he's losing it. Is that because Alito and Thomas are essentially like becoming these two uh, uh, very emboldened uh, players within the court? And my sense, too, is that maybe Kavanaugh and Roberts find some like connections as a little bit more pragmatic. I know I'm restating some of the stuff we already said, but that's just yeah. some, that's what I see from the outside. It's just so hard to say. I think that's right. And I think that you know, they had some big win. The right wing of the court, the far right wing of the court, we should say, had some big wins over the past couple of years, Dobbs in particular. And I think that emboldened uh, right wing lawyers across the country to bring cases more aggressively. And so not only do you have the uh, the right wing with Alito, Thomas, and sometimes Gorsuch um, exercising a good amount of control, but People are pitching to them. Um, arguments are being designed mm. to their sensibilities. Um, you know, it, it all, it all, I think if you're someone like Roberts, it all starts to irritate you is my, is my best guess. And in, in some cases it might work um, because Roberts does have um, some pretty aggressive right-wing beliefs in many regards. But uh, after a while, my guess is it's wearing on him. Um, he doesn't, he might not feel particularly strongly um, about, you know, the, the gap between the center right and the far right on a particular issue in a way that Clarence Thomas might. That's interesting, because um, in some ways what you're saying is he's signaling to the, you know, Federalist Society and broader sort of legal circles, uh, you know, I'm the I, chief I, have, I have limits. And so, right. you know, bring me something that's not, you know, uh, so so stark. Um, let's talk about the other case that happened. I mean, I, I don't know that this was as much as, as, as a surprise, yeah. uh, but it, it, the implications of it were, were pretty huge. Um, and this was a case, uh, the, um, I can never, uh, tell that I, I can't, I, yeah. yes, thank yeah. you. Um, and in this case, uh, dealt with the rights of, 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 of third parties, essentially, to make state officials and other entities follow federal law, uh, essentially. Yeah, uh, there was a state-run Medicaid-funded nursing home in Indiana that allegedly engaged in some uh, abusive or otherwise violative of the law conduct toward a patient, uh, potentially in violation of the Federal Nursing Home Reform Act, and the question was whether they could be sued for that under Section 1983, which is this recon Reconstruction Era law that creates a cause of action for lawsuits against state officials where they violate your rights. Uh, the, the section is very broad. It says that you can sue for the violation of any rights secured by the Constitution and laws. Um, and Katanji Brown Jackson writes the uh, majority basically saying that's super broad. It applies to this case. They violated a federal law. Uh, you can sue when uh, federal laws are violated under Section 93, 1983 as a general principle. So it's fine. Um, but the, the argument that the nursing home was making was that Section 1983 does not apply to laws passed under Congress's spending power, with the idea being that this that spending clause legislation is sort of akin to a contract, meaning the idea is that in, re in exchange for federal funds, states agree to certain conditions, in this case, compliance with um, certain Medicaid rules and regs. Um, and so the idea was, you know, this isn't exactly a federal law in the traditional sense. And if the court bought into that, uh, Thomas and Alito buy into it, um, if the court bought into that, you're basically saying that this huge swath of what we consider to be federal law, Medicaid in particular, uh, is essentially outside of the scope of one of the only laws that allows for private enforcement. So anything that regulators can't catch is fair game. Uh, with the, you know, the big fear being that red states could effectively stop it, um, for stop enforcing certain key provisions of Medicaid 
you know, for example, the requirement that low income people be covered, um, it, you know, in a, in a sort of disaster scenario, especially under a Republican administration in the future. Um, so I, I, this was not as surprising, but there was a real risk, not just to Medicaid, but to um, spending clause legislation more broadly. I, I, there, there are two things that struck me as one is that that theory of it being a contract is bizarro. I mean, it's I mean, I understand why they do it, but it also seems like that would have been really quite a lift. Like that's what that's 90 percent I mean, of what Congress does is basically it's, spent. It's deeply bizarre. Um, Tom, I mean, Thomas tries his best. He basically he basically says that the conditions that the government places on federal funds are meaningfully distinct from federal law. And um, I mean, I don't I don't buy it. I suppose I you you can make the argument that it's a different type of law, but um, I don't see it as materially distinct from any other law. It's enforceable through the power of the federal government, blah, blah, blah. Um, he's sort of hearkening to what's called anti-commandeering principles, which is the idea that the federal government can't use its spending power to sort of to commandeer states, to make the states do what they want and sort of infringe upon their sovereignty. We, we should say that was uh, basically uh, like um, in terms of a principle, sort of a cousin to uh, what they ruled in the ACA case where they said and 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 people found that completely bizarre, too. I mean, I remember interviewing a bunch of, of legal scholars as the case was you know across the street from the Supreme Court. And they're like, eh, and there's also this sleeper thing where they're saying that you can't expand the the, the federal government cannot leverage their, uh, you know, they can't change their Medicaid program to expand it. Uh, and everybody was like, eh, <laughs> that's and and of course, that was the one sort of thing that uh, the Roberts court decided was, oh, yeah, you can't force people to expand a federal program. Right. Um, and it's, a, it's a, like an like an odd adjunct to that but i also just wanted to know too that these two cases were both so fundamentally grounded in the decade or so following the civil war i mean that the the yeah. laws that we got during that time uh, have are basically the the laws that we operate under uh, in this country now yeah and i mean it, interestingly uh, a lot of the big cases before the court this term, including, you know, the affirmative action cases are really about laws and amendments passed in this era and which, you know, in in the view of the conservatives are sort of this ancillary portion of our Constitution and our law. And you can see it in the way Thomas writes about Section 1983 here. Um, but I think in the view, in my view, in the view of the liberals on the court, that was an era that sort of restructured the relationship between people and the constitution, people and the states. Totally. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not something that is sort of limited to reconstruction era law. It's something that should shape how people interact with the government today, including when it comes to Medicaid, for example. I mean, uh, it, it, it... Uh, the the overwhelming majority of cases that seem to go to the Supreme Court end up dealing with um, with uh, amendments e from that era, from the era of Reconstruction and uh, and, and statutes. I mean, 1983, we should say, exp you know, be explicit about it, was basically a fear that uh, states were not going to abide by the new rules that you can't have slaves and uh, the way you treat uh, black people. I mean, that's what that was uh, originally designed for, um, to make sure that they understood that they were under the, uh, you know, the watchful eye, I guess, of the federal government or in some way. Right. There was recourse for people who, who were not being getting the benefits of, of federal law. Let's you mentioned affirmative action. Uh, tee that up for us, because we're going to get this ruling in the next week or two or days or minutes? yeah yeah um so there are a couple of consolidated or no longer consolidated actually uh cases about affirmative action one is against unc and one is against harvard um the difference being of course that unc is a public school and therefore has to abide by the equal protection clause of the 14th amendment uh, so the question there is whether the court is going to allow 
race conscious emissions at all. Uh, something that Roberts has shown uh, a great disdain for historically, especially in the education context. Although, you know, the Milligan case is right. maybe the first right. time we've seen him give an implicit thumbs up to race consciousness under the Constitution at all. Um, is that an is that enough to hang our hat on and say that maybe this comes out the other way? I I don't know. Um, it, it you know certainly Roberts has historically been uh, very opposed to affirmative action as it exists in public schools. Um, so I think at least it, before Milligan, everyone thought this was a slam dunk, six three, it's over for uh, affirmative action in public schools, race conscious uh, affirmative action at least at public schools. Um, and public schools will have to sort of rethink how they structure their admissions process. Um, the Harvard case, a little more nuanced because Harvard is uh, not a public school, but they are under the umbrella of Title VI because they receive federal funding. And, um, and ultimately what this means is that there is still an assessment of whether their admissions process uh, is considering race too much, whether the whether they are, in this case, discriminating against Asian Americans, which is the angle being brought here. Um, they have a sort of convoluted admissions process because it's Harvard, but, you know, there are all these categories that uh, applicants get assessed against, and then it, you know, they, you get bonus points for different things, one of which is uh, potentially racial diversity. Um, then there's, of course, whether you're the child of uh, alum and donors uh, and faculty, which is more important for the record. Um, and uh, and all of that is sort of being challenged as um, improperly considering race and potentially even just, just um, outright discriminating against Asian Americans who have apparently been scoring notably low on one of the categories, uh, the personal category, which relies very heavily on um, essays and recommendations and things like that. So there's a lot of nuance there. It's a slightly more interesting case in a way because there's a, a many different directions the court could go with it. All right. And we'll hear about that in the next, um, uh, you know, pr at least within the next two weeks or so, uh, more than likely. Yeah. Um, lastly, the uh, student debt case. There's and this is sort of like an ongoing like because even in the debt ceiling deal, theoretically, there was a provision that was agreed to and, and voted on. Uh, that could theoretically implicate the case, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very, uh, so a lot of what's happening is, is, I mean, there's a lot of moving moving parts. Uh, the the biggest one, I, I, I think, is actually the fact that the COVID emergency is, has ended, uh, per the Biden administration, uh, at least. And that basically means that the way that this comes out strongly dictates the future for uh, for borrowers, uh, because there are no emergency angles for um, extending the payment pause and uh, and potentially forgiving more debt. Um, so, I I I mean, this one has me ang the, it has me anxious, even though I think I'm like cautiously optimistic, because uh, as we discussed last time, I think this yeah. this case for standing is just so terrible from uh, mm -hmm. the challengers. But um, let's it, just remind let's just remind yeah. everybody it's the the authority that they chose is under the Heroes Act. Uh, mm -hmm. We can get to that in a moment, but let's deal with the standing issue, because this is this is sort of the easy way out for the court to sort of say, like, we're yeah. not going to weigh in on this case. You know, we reserve the right in the future to uh, stop a president from uh, from relieving debt in this way. But. Um, uh, just remind people about the standing. Sure. So, you know, the, the idea behind standing is that you have to be injured uh, in some direct enough way to bring a case. And that's sort of awkward here for a lot of the folks bringing uh, challenges to the loan forgiveness program, because it's relatively hard to make the case that you've been injured by uh, someone else getting their loan forgiven. Uh, so you have borrowers, for example, who are literally saying, you know, we didn't qualify for loan forgiveness, but we want it. And therefore we are injured and deserve to uh, bring a lawsuit, which is uh, 
outside of the realm of traditional standing, uh, if I could put it lightly. Um, I mean, then, theoretically, I, w w you know, uh, you could sue the government for, <laughs> because I'm not eligible for Medicaid. Right. Or I mean, just any any federal program or or maybe even any disbursement of funds. Um, right. It's very similar to what's called taxpayer standing, which is long rejected, which is, you know, the idea that you could potentially sue just because you don't like what the government's doing with your money, with your tax money as a taxpayer. Um, the the more colorable challenge comes from Missouri. Um, they have a state student loan authority, Mohella, which they say is injured by the forgiveness program because if the debt is canceled, some debt holders will consolidate their outstanding debt, which will reduce the uh, loan authority's revenue, all of which is probably true. But the real problem that they have is that Mohella is a separately incorporated entity which opted not to challenge the lawsuit, um, which means that there is like a, you know, a better challenger to the lawsuit that chose not to not to bring it, which courts will often use as a good reason to, to kick a case um, so there's really no one that has a good claim to being injured there. Um, that said, standing is, you know, a relatively malleable sort of fake doctrine. So the court can do what they want to a degree. OK, so assuming that they accept the standing of these people, the right of these uh, plaintiffs to sue, um, then the case um, it, it depends on what? Because. There was some controversy at the time in which Biden uh, did the loan forgiveness. And there was two different provisions, statutory provisions that they could have employed. One was the HEROES Act, which is mm -hmm. what, you know, why people are still getting compensated from 9-11 um, and, and allowed like the Secretary of Education to relieve debt under uh, the auspices of an emergency. Even if right. that emergency is not continuing, 9-11 ended 20 years ago, 22 years ago. The other is just the uh, Education Act, I think, of like 1965, which allows sure. the Secretary of Education to uh, relieve debt. Um, what is your opinion? And, and I know you went over this last time, but just briefly, your opinion on reliance of either one of those. And if that made a difference, particularly in light of the way that it was argued. I don't think it made a difference. Um, certainly moving forward, there's a real difference uh, as the emergency ends and gets farther away, the COVID emergency. Um, all of a sudden you're in a place where heroes just can't apply anymore and um, it's impossible to argue that it could. Uh, and you're kind of stuck with the Higher Education Act. There were people, um, scholars who I respect, who believe that the Higher Education Act was the better vehicle here. Um, but the Heroes Act authorizes uh, Biden to waive or modify any statutory or regula regulatory provision applicable to the student lo loan program in emergencies. Um, that's broad authority. Uh, the problem with that and what will ultimate, would ultimately be the problem with the Higher Education Act is that the court has not been very respectful of broad delegations of authority to administrative agencies. Um, they will call it a major question, analyze it under the major questions framework, uh, which of course is sort of inspired by non-delegation concepts, the idea that Congress should not be able to delegate significant or maybe any uh, powers to administrative agencies. Um, I don't personally think that you can end run around the major questions doctrine analysis either way. And our experience of that analysis so far is that it is whatever the conservatives like and don't like as a policy matter. Um, right. So I'm I'm not super. Con I think there are colorable arguments that if you are looking at the text of the law, that maybe the Higher Education Act is better in certain regards. Um, but I'm not convinced that that those differences are enough to matter. But and it, and it, we should say we should say, though, the 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 theory about it being under the Heroes Act is that Trump and Biden both had paused and created this moratorium where there was money that was was lost by the government. And so if the authority worked there, why can't it work here? I think was the sort of theory like this is already we're already engaging in this activity under this auspices. So we can just do this other thing under this auspices, which is more or less the same thing. 
Yeah, and I think that the fact that the Trump administration had used the HEROES Act was most likely what the Biden folks were thinking, that they can make this argument that this is not a novel concept. This is not a novel interpretation of the HEROES Act, really. It's just a sort of natural extension of what even Donald Trump had done. Um, and they could, you know, hang their hat on that to a bit. And, uh, and I think that I think that that's a relatively effective argument. Um, it, it's something that is somewhat hard. Uh, it, it, sh it sort of showed in oral argument um, that it was somewhat hard for the uh, challengers to the law to work their way around that. But if if, say, now we're, we're in the third kind of hypothetical tier here, if they accept both the standing and the argument that this was beyond the authority delegated to him in the HEROES Act, can Biden return for a second bite at the apple using that other authority, in theory at least, to cancel student debt in the same way? I would think so. Um, I would not. Um, I, you know, I, I don't have my sort of finger on the pulse from a political perspective, um, but from a legal perspective, there's really nothing stopping it. Um, the, you know, the question is more about political appetite and um, whether, and it also sort of depends what the court does on the merits. You know, if they say this is a major question and provide a really uh, aggressive test that the a really aggressive hurdle that Biden would need to get over um, for a delegation in the HEROES Act context that that applies perhaps in some regards to the Higher Education Act context, um, it might be that the court sort of stymies Biden's ability to do it with their decision. As it stands right now, at least theoretically, he could he could do it. Um, it's it's you know it's not out of the realm of possibility. All right, and I have two two other elements that I think we should at least mention because if people go back and do some reading on this, th this will come up. One is during the American Rescue Act, or I should say within the American Rescue Act, Congress said that any student debt forgiveness between now and 2025, if I remember correctly, was not going to be subject to income tax uh, as a, like, um, you know, service in kind or, or, or some type of like income when loan forgiveness generally is considered that. Mm -hmm. That's w one element. And the other is that in the debt ceiling negotiations, the Congress voted to end the moratorium, uh, you know, with it uh, by September 1st, I think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not saying we're, we're, all, we are not, it, it's not just up to Biden's choice. We're going to insist that the moratorium ends September 1st, which is a tacit, a, a tacit acknowledgement, if not an explicit one, that Biden had the authority to continue it. Therefore, they right. wanted to end it. And if Biden had the, the authority to do the debt moratorium, which he could have theoretically done forever, um, then Congress is acknowledging in two different ways that the administration has the authority to do this. What, what, what's your sense of the, how that will play? Or do you think they'll just ignore it? I think that they will ignore it um, or simply say that Congress is, you know, acting pragmatically, uh, generally speaking. This, it, it feels like something that, you know, gets a snarky footnote out of Alito or something, um, but, uh, but nothing more. Uh, I, you know, I tend to, I tend to agree with you um, that it does show some tacit ignition, admission there. But um, I, I have seen the court handle that sort of like, you know, Im, uh, sort of acceptance of power by implication thing uh, very dismissively before. So that's my best guess. I think that tax one is, 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 uh, is certainly stronger of the, of the, of the two, but um, all right. Well, I mean, I think that comes, is there any other case that you, you in particular, like, do you have like a sleeper case or, or, or is that basically the docket? Um, well, no, there are cases. I mean, I, I, I barely sleep anymore. The, uh, you know, the, the, the case I'm probably worried about the most, although I, another one where I'm sort of cautiously optimistic is Brackeen about the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, and that is coming up. Uh, and there's, you know, there have been arguments that the Indian Child Welfare Act is potentially unconstitutional in, in some regard, uh, which would be a, a sort of nightmare for tribal rights. Uh, and the reason I'm cautiously optimistic is because Gorsuch has been good on this stuff uh, in the past. And so uh, you only need you only need one more. 
Um, but I, I am worried and I certainly don't want to be on the record saying that there are no more cases to be concerned about. Uh, you, sh you should be worried all the time. Uh, I, uh, done. Yeah. Uh, Peter Shamshiri, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Uh, we will put a link to uh, your Twitter handle, Law Boy. We will put a link to the uh, Five Four podcast, which you co-host and you are aware of. And also, uh, we will put a, a link to a, uh, if books could kill. Not that it needs it, obviously. I mean, <laughs> right, maybe we'll just make it a dead link. It just it jumped on the scene. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave the link off. What was your guys's first episode that just like exploded? I mean, well, I haven't uh, seen. I think Freakonomics. We did a Freakonomics, Freakonomics. episode, and, and then yeah, it got big. That, it's just that's you don't see that a ton from a leftist podcast starting out out so congratulations all right peter Thank thanks you. i appreciate thanks. it folks yeah. thanks so much for your time appreciate it all right folks we are going to head into the um uh the fun half of the program mm -hmm. uh wherein we will take your uh, phone calls not all you know all your phone calls but some if you're jordan peterson we will if you're jordan peterson <laughs> calling in yeah we Stop the butchery. Mm, he, he won't. He won't Emma call. got into it with Jordan Peterson last night. By accident. Um, I mean, he got he, he started, the doctor started I've had me. some sherry, and it's time for me to start to shit post. <laughs> I Where's the girls? Where's the girls? Bring okay. me the young lady. <laughs> Bring me the young woman. There we go. All right. Where can I deploy this one? Okay. Um... Yeah. Folks, it's your support that makes the show possible. You can become a member at jointhemajorityreport.com. When you do, you not only get the free half free of commercials, you get the fun half. And you allow this show to survive and thrive. Uh, you also get to IM the show through our free app. Our app is free to everybody, but it has enhancements. If you sign in as a member, you can IM the show. Mm -hmm. You can search in your little phone. Every episode that we have, and like we're, we're going back in, in tagging that it's a big project. Um, but that's one of the things that your membership um, payments do is they allow us to do projects like that where we go back and tag because we got to go through all the stuff that Michael, uh, you know, uh, wrote up because he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't tag any of that <laughs> stuff. Uh, but speaking of which, um, I again, feel like I remember the onboarding process where he's like, yeah, I don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> totally. It was totally like that was like and there was this one thing like back in like twenty twelve or, or maybe it was like yeah, twenty twelve, where I would like, dude, will you please make a guest list? And you know, so that we have a list of the guests that we had had on even by twenty twelve or twenty thirteen, we had a very impressive list of guests. Like, yeah, the people I was really excited about and and I'm like, just we're gonna all you gotta do is put their name on a page that we have called guest list and just link back to the thing. Mm. And literally, like every, you know, like get a yawn. Three <laughs> every three weeks, I'd be like, dude, have you done that? Oh, I forgot to do it. We should ask Binder about this one time. And it was like an ongoing thing for about two or three years, and then I just gave up. Probably need an AI to do something. Yeah, like I that. just need I just gave up. I wonder if we can get AI to do that. Probably, yeah. I wonder if we can get AI to do... The thing is, is like people... I'm waiting for AI to actually help my research things, which is like, I want uh, to be able to like put in a PDF of the 19 or 1883 Bismarck Tribune and it give me like text of that. Yes. And it is not even anywhere close to yes. being able to like... How is that technology of scanning... What are you talking about? Like optical character recognition? Yes, oh, yes. That exists. You've got that on your phone. You do, but it is not... It's, it's good not for advanced. something you can read really clearly with your eyes, but like if you get something like old type font mm -hmm. and not... And it's like, like an old scan of images, you can read that with your brain way better than OCR. You'll have to go and manually fix a lot of that. I don't believe that. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I, was say, I, can, I can open Adobe Acrobat yeah, right now. The, the look on your face when I said that was totally like you were completely lost. It's a no big impediment to, to my uh, research. So, uh, but uh, my point of bringing that up is, and I mentioned this before, I don't know when it's going to be released, but um, uh, I, I voiced the audiobook version of Against the Web, and it's going to be out relatively soon it was uh you know it, it was it was like a sub part of what michael would have done but um he he couldn't do it so um that should be out uh soon 
Also, uh, and we'll let you know, of course, when that happens. Um, also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. You get 10% off. Uh, Emma. Mm. They're having hearings in the Senate, I think, about this uh, live PGA thing. Yeah, we did a really deep dive into it. Um, it's an interesting... Has I, your opinion changed? Not necessarily. I would say that, you know, well, you guys got to check out ESVN to, to go through it. But it's it's it, this is a very cynical move by the PGA to spin off its uh, tax-exempt arm and then get the funding for the for-profit element being basically funded by the same people that fund live so it's not necessarily a merger so i don't know if the antitrust uh angle works as much well there but regardless if you want to hear the deep dive you can go to youtube.com slash esvn show we also spoke about uh the stanley cup and nba playoffs i mean we predicted the nuggets would close it out and they did and uh but check out our predictions for tonight for the panthers and the golden knights um, all right. Uh, I just, a lot of people are IMing the, uh, the book, the audio book is out today. Oh, wow. It is out today. So we'll put a link to that. Awesome. Um, you can go check it out against the web, uh, cosmopolitan answer to the new, right? It was, uh, Michael wrote it back, <clears throat> uh, almost like, uh, three years, uh, three years and a month or two ago in April of 2020. And uh, the audio is out. Um, so check it out. The uh, We'll put a link to that. And uh, let us know uh, what you think. Um, the audio book is out. I didn't realize that. Incredible. It's exciting. Is that on Audible? Or where is it at? Um, I, I think it is on Audible. Uh, certainly, I see it on, uh, on Amazon right now. And I wonder... If it's on, if, if, if zero has a, um, you know, a specific way to get it. There it, it is. Uh, two, uh, two hours, 58 minutes. Oh, I have it on my phone here, but against the web, a cosmopolitan answer to the new right, uh, available, narrated by Sam Cedar. Who's that guy? Where is that on Amazon or uh, is on, it? Uh, audible here on audible. So there it is, folks. You can check it out. Um, there we go. Nice. Oh, that's awesome. Is there a sample? Can we play a sample down there? Yeah. Two hours and 50, uh, yeah, right down at the bottom, right down there where the headphones are. He's putting up the audio. Starring a bald Jeremy Piven. Came out in <laughs> 1994, 10 years before the first season of The Apprentice, and a full 24 years before Barry Weiss's piece hit the New York Times, these complaints were shop-worn cliches. There you go. So is the oh, IDW oh. just a rebranding of old-style cultural conservatism? No. There you go. That's awesome. You're going to want to put that on 1.25 uh, <laughs> speed. Yep. It's going to be weird listening to sound with no ums and ahs. That's true. <laughs> that is true. So that, that is so going to be a really weird experience for a lot of people. The cadence is going to be off. How can yep. we prove it was a, it was not AI? Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. We're so close to that. Uh, it's also on Scribd, I've been told. So let's put all the links to it uh, in any format, um, and uh, you can uh, you can check that out. I'm psyched about that. I didn't realize. I mean, I heard uh, I heard from. Uh, Alicia, but I didn't know that it was actually out. I, I assume that's a very that's quick turnaround. Out. That was a quick turnaround. Um, so check that out. That's exciting. Um, Matt. Yeah, tonight, Left Reckoning, 7 o'clock Eastern Time. We got Nick French. Uh, we're talking about wokeness and Marxism and why if you, uh, uh, that's the, the proper way to uh, orient your fight against oppression. We're also talking about Trump's indictment. And uh, in the post game, patreon.com slash left reckoning, I'm going to go into a deep dive into what uh, AI means for gamers. And uh, it means similar things to uh, what crypto meant, which is bad things. So, ah. uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning. All right, folks, 646-257-3920 is the number. We will see you in the fun half. You are in for it. All right, folks. Six four six two five seven thirty nine twenty. See you in the fun. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready?
Wait, who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back, and the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it to my throat. Alpha males are back, 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 back. Snowflakes has what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar! What a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare! What a fucking nightmare! nightmare. bring back DJ Denner. Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. Oh, yeah. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psycho. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflakes says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little part of you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keeping it 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Someone needs to pay the price for blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total. We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigland on the Majority Report. Emma's just uh, getting comfortable. Um, Wonder Breder. Hey, Sam and MR crew, I've been wanting to do some reading on the rise and fall of Weimar. I went to Reddit to look for suggestions, but Reddit's having a user strike right now. Do you guys have any suggestions purely historical and on political and cultural events? First off, the Reddit thing, I, I just read about that. Um, and I guess apparently like all third party apps are ruined on uh, Reddit and they're they're having cutbacks. And um, it is a sort of the classic um what Cory Doctorow calls the shitification of... Well, and it's interesting because I think Elon, his presence at Twitter, is masking a lot of this shitification in tech, which is like basically like, I think fundamentally, um, I think is it Jacob Silverman who is on this beat? Like, cheap money era is over. Yes. And these play, now all of a sudden the money men are like, hey, we need to actually get some return on this Yes, stuff. that's exactly what's going on. And, and, but that's what he says... That's what Cory Doctorow says it happens with all uh, of these companies, right. regardless. But the cheap money is certainly accelerating it, which is uh, they come out uh, and the service is great because they don't care about making revenue. Right. And then uh, there's actually like a three stage thing. It's like where then um, they uh, start to let in advertisers and then they they the the dynamic from user to advertiser shifts where they're starting to service instead of the user they're starting to service the advertiser mm -hmm. 
and it gets slowly uh, crappier and crappier. And I mean, I would say also the need for endless growth um, for these companies when they like get all that cheap money, but then they become publicly traded is to consistently like provide an increased return on investment, which puts like pressure on these situations. And it's like, you know, the, and endless growth is impossible, especially for these tech services. I it's, only it's do not anything. Possible. The only thing I do now it has to have a hundred X return or I'm not. Uh, yeah, yeah I'm right. Not even, but this yeah, is, and that's it. That's, that's why we do our guests the way we do. Just exactly. Only a hundred X return. Only. Yeah. <laughs> on Supreme Court stuff. Yeah. And, and like, it's not, at, it's not perfect, but like, this is why like a Wikipedia model is like something oh, yeah. that like, I'm glad exists 100%. to yes. point to because yeah. people are like, how could this exist unless you just take a whole bunch of money from, uh, you know, uh, financiers who are going to demand it back in five years and to the point of like stripping your thing for parts and of those tech services reddit by far was i feel like the most empowering for